So I want to say first thank you to Humanities Texas. Um, I think these workshops are really important. Um, I, I teach college, and you know, when I do the U.S. History Survey, which all Texas students, all students at public universities in Texas are required to take U.S. History one and two, and I'm thrilled by that. Um, when I have a sea of like 300 faces, it's amazing to me just how quickly I am reminded of the fact that the work that you guys are doing is so fundamentally important. And so mm -hmm. I, I applaud y'all for the work that you guys do, and I'm glad that you're here today. So this is, this is really how I structure this in, in my survey classes, and I'm teaching the rise and fall of the slave south right now with some of my students. But, you know, we have these sort of broad arc sort of pieces about how these things fit together. So the guiding question that I use, right, and when I'm talking about these things, is that it doesn't just erupt in the 1850s, right? It doesn't just, and, and, and we talked about this in detail earlier, and I think it was really well placed. This is an evolution over time. Slavery is an evolving institution, right? So you have to historicize it, but it doesn't come full circle in the 1850s. There's a long, slow build that gets there. And to make it make sense for our students, I think we need to address that and tie things together. All right, so one of the things I want to give for you guys is a broad kind of narrative arc that you can use to tie things together, hitting things that you're familiar with, but changing some of the emphases to help, help you contextualize what you're going to be dealing with in the teaks. All right, does that make sense? All right, so let me, let me dive in here. What I would say um, is that if you want to talk about the road to the American Civil War, you need to talk about some major pivot points that tie things together in this broad arc of things, right? And when you come out of the American Revolution, if you guys talk about that in your classroom, you know, most of the founders, including Thomas Jefferson, um, were embarrassed by slavery, right? And saw openly the contradictions between talking about liberty and freedom for themselves in this new nation and the reality of them owning slaves, and especially in the southern colonies now states, um, and the scale that they did. This is why the word slavery does not appear in the Constitution. Slavery is in the Constitution, but they don't say the word because they're embarrassed by this fact. And they're hoping, Thomas Jefferson, again, perfect example, that this will somehow fade away. It does not, and we know that, obviously, right? One of the major reasons is the Cotton Revolution, right? So what I would emphasize to you in terms of making broad arcs of how things fit together, right? The Cotton Revolution is something you can't overemphasize, all right? The Cotton Revolution of the early, especially the early 1800s, really transforms everything not just in the United States and the southern United States, but really the Atlantic world in a big sort of way, all right? And you can trace this to big things that you need to talk about in the broader development of the world. Um, the, the Industrial Revolution and really how it gets started, you know, in the British Empire, in England itself, in places like Manchester and Preston, right? Where the, this is the, the beginnings of modern society, the mechanization of things, mass production, right? All that's being built around textiles, which I know. Your seventh graders, eighth graders are gonna be so excited to talk about cloth. <laughs> what could be more exciting than that, right? But I explained to them, right? This is what made the modern world. We're like the British industrialists are realizing, hey, we can produce wool. I'm wearing a wool suit right now, right? By shearing Scottish sheep. And then we feed them through these machines and put out this cloth and it's amazing. And the best part is we can make a ton of money doing it. And the British do. And they build this massive trade empire in the Atlantic world, basically as a trade empire. And, and textiles was the epicenter of that, right? And it's during the late 1700s and then the early 1800s that the, the, the British start experimenting with not producing this as wool turned into, 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 um, um, into textiles, but to experiment with this new fiber, which is not really new, um, but cotton as a potential alternative for that, right? And it's got a lot of advantages, right? Cotton is softer and more comfortable. It's also very durable. Um, and you can, you, can, you can print things on it, uh, which is to say you can make things fashionable, right? And so you can sell things and then resell things to people, um, not just because they've worn out their particular shirt or pants or dress or whatever, but because the fashions have changed. Um, but more importantly than that, if you can grow cotton, you can scale this up, right? There are only so many sheep you can shear in the British Empire. If you can, however, grow large amounts of cotton, you can then scale this up on a larger scale, and then that can make all the difference. So the British start doing that, all right? In the late 1700s, early 1800s, the real pivot point is right after the, um, the War of 1812, right? Which ends in 1815. And when that happens, the full transition is really going on in the British Isles. And so the British move from, from wool to cotton in a massive way. And they put out a call. And they scream and yell, we will pay top dollar or top pound, I guess, um, for as much raw cotton as anyone can possibly produce and send to us. And, and this is the kicker. 
The price of cotton doubles overnight in 1815, from 15 cents a pound to 30 cents a pound. Boom, right? What does that produce? Something that you need to talk about in a lot of contexts in your classrooms, which is this massive migration that then ensues into the Mississippi River Valley, right? So you guys see this map right here that has all kinds of arrows. This is, these are people moving by the, by the thousands, tens of thousands, ultimately hundreds of thousands of people who move down to the Mississippi River Valley, along the Mississippi River, into places that will be Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, to grow cotton. They're reacting to the British market, all right? And they're going to the Mississippi River Valley, and the arrows are people coming up and down rivers mostly, because those are the highways of the 19th century, because it's a great place to grow cotton, right? It's hot there in Mississippi, which means you have a lot of frost-free days. You've got a lot of um, potential there. You have wonderful alluvial soils, but most important of all, you have a ready-made you know, river system with the Mississippi, with New Orleans as an international port, just sitting there for the international market. It's almost ready-made. In the aftermath of the War of 1812, it's more accessible than ever for reasons we don't have time to talk about right now, unfortunately, right? So people move in, right, to build this, to build the factories in the field, these plantation districts. It was the ideal. Because if you can, if you can do this, if you can plant cotton, pick it, right, clean it, you know, these guys are, are picking it right here and they're cleaning it and then they're putting it into these bales that are 450 pound bricks of money, basically, right? If you can put on that steamship right there, which you guys can see in the background, right? And send that down the river to New Orleans. You can put that on a boat to, to Liverpool, England, right? You can fill the hull of that ship with cotton bales. You can literally make a boatload of money, right, doing this. And so, the United States goes from producing virtually no cotton on the global scale in the early 1800s to, by 1820, we surpass India as the world's leading producer of cotton. And we are also producing 85% of all the cotton the entire British Empire is consuming, which is an enormous amount, right? We become the supplier of the British Empire, right? So we talked earlier about northern industrialists being dependent upon us. This is a British world that people are living in, and it's the British who are depending on the South throughout all of this in a big and even more powerful way than northern industrialists are during this time period. You want to talk about global systems, right? Now, the reason this matters, right, that we need to talk about all this is, is that <laughs> what's this being built on? When you think of Mississippi plantations, what are we talking about? Slave labor. Slave labor, right? And so, um, you know, by 1820, as early as 1820, 40% of all the people who are coming down to this territory are, in, are not coming voluntarily. They're enslaved men, women, and children who are being brought down through this interstate slave trade that is becoming bigger and, and more um, efficient than ever, that's bringing people from the, you know, Virginia in particular, the Carolinas, um, Kentucky, sold down the river, down the Mississippi to places like Natchez and then New Orleans, who are being a part of all of this, right? Why? Because it's really profitable. It is incredibly profitable. It is disturbingly profitable. How much you can make if you are able to leverage enslaved labor on these plantations, right? Every, every enslaved person you could put to work on your plantation would mean eight to 10 more acres in cultivation. That's eight to 10 more bales every single year, right? That is an enormous investment that if you can make it and maintain it, will pay back enormous dividends. So as early as 1820, every third person in Alabama was enslaved. Half of all Louisianans were enslaved, all right? And so the result is this massive, rapid expansion south and westward within the United States, right, that we need to talk about. We're talking about the, 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 the road into the Jacksonian era and this expansion period in American history. And that's important, all right? Mississippi and Alabama become states in 1817 and 1819, respectively, all right? And so you have this quick expansion down here. Here's the thing about the American political system. It's tied to geography, right? Because the expansion of states means the expansion of political power. Every state has representation, one House of uh, Representatives member, two senators. So the incorporation of new states means an expansion and a change in political power. This is one of the epicenters of the American experiment that becomes controversial as we start spreading westward across the continent, right? This is what will disturb Jefferson in the controversies of Missouri. Because this massive expansion here happens quickly, and it seems like slavery is expanding so rapidly that when Missouri tries to get admitted, right, um, this, this disturbs some folks in the north. Because it's, it's fairly northward, right? Like, look, at, it's right next to Illinois. Like, you could be a slaveholder here and be far north of free territory in southern Illinois, um, or Indiana, or Ohio, for that matter, or Pennsylvania, right? 
this is expansion in these directions as it's tied to political power. I know you guys know this. I know you guys talk about this in your classrooms, but it's really worth emphasizing that these are not idle debates about how many people are in the Senate. This had real world consequences, and people are worried about Southerners and Northerners, what this is going to mean in real time. So when you get the Missouri Compromise, when you talk about the debates about all of this, it's tied to you know, what happens to all this territory that Thomas Jefferson, we keep coming back to him, brought into the United States with the Louisiana Purchase, right? The, the compromise they come up with, it, amazingly, you know, the Missouri Compromise line right there, um, looks like it's going to cap off the further expansion of slavery. All right? If you look at this map right here, right? North of here, going to be free territory. South of here, I mean, I guess, you know, Arkansas. <laughs> slash Oklahoma, um, is going to be possibly slave territory. But that's basically it. There's not a lot of future there in terms of expansion, right? We don't talk about that that much, in part because we know that that changes. Part of the reason that changes, and I would emphasize this to your students because we are here in Texas, if you're teaching U.S. history, incorporating stuff in the local stuff matters and helps them dive into why this place and the geography they live in matters, right? Part of the reason that, that that compromise does not cut off the further expansion of slavery is that cotton doesn't stop at the U.S. line. The, the cotton explosion and empire that it is building goes into Mexico, into here in Texas when it was a part of Mexico. And I've researched and written a lot about that. I don't have time to go into it a whole lot. But um, when you have people like Stephen F. Austin, when you have the migration that happens into Mexico during that time, those are cotton planters. Those are cotton farmers who are taking the model of Mississippi and going to Mexico. Why? There's a lot of reasons. One of which is they can get a lot more land in Mexico, a lot cheaper than getting Mississippi. But they can grow cotton on a large scale, they hope, and send it across um, to the British. And so what happens is, in the story of Texas, and especially because if you're teaching eighth grade U.S. history, obviously they're coming right out of seventh grade Texas history, right? And so they've heard about the Republic of Texas. They've talked about all of these things, right? I would frame that. This works well in my classroom, and I think it's a good context point for talking to your students about this, that the Republic of Texas, as it rises and then ultimately falls, is built around cotton. It's built around um, controversies over slavery. And because of that, slavery does end up expanding westward beyond these compromises and lines that are drawn in 18, 20, 21, right? Why do we bust through this? Because Texas becomes a republic and then gets annexed to the United States, right? And there's all, you guys talk about the controversies over that. It's all about slavery. It's all about expansion. Once again, it's about power in the American political system that's tied especially to the number of senators that every state gets. Um, and so when Texas joins the United States, by the way, because the Republic of Texas is an absolute disaster, it doesn't work. Uh, well, it was, and, uh, but that's, you know, the reason that matters is because that collapse and that joining the United States then inaugurates this war with Mexico, right? And I say inaugurates. James K. Polk forces a war with Mexico. Um, but when that happens, when that happens, right, what happens is the lines on the United States map is, and North American map is redrawn dramatically. The Rio Grande becomes the border, and so does um, right over here, uh, minus the Gadsden Purchase in 1853, right? But you have this massive amount of territory that is brought in to the United States. Once again, you can thank Texas for that. Um, and that gets us to, you know, by the time you get to the, the mid-1840s, right, the eve of the 1850s, right? Slavery has already been controversial. I think that's really something we have to frame for our students explicitly and let them know this doesn't just show up out of nowhere, right? This is a culminating experience in all of that. So that when you do get, though, to 1848, right, the end of the U.S.-Mexico War and the, the Mexican Cession, the land between Texas and California, 500,000 square miles of land that is taken from Mexico, but it's really taken from the Indians who live in the territory. Um, I know. But whatever, it, it, it redraws the map of, the, of, the, of North America. You have all this land in here. The question, of course, is, again, tied to geography, expansion, and what it means for politics in the United States political system. What is going to happen to these territories? Are they going to become slave states or free states? Right? That is the question in everybody's mind. It's a debate during the U.S.-Mexico War, the Wilmot Proviso, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but the question then is what that's going to become. People think, of course, that they have time. There's going to be lots of time, right? So in 48, that's kind of a, a problem, but on the horizon. It becomes an immediate problem. Why? Because what's discovered in 1849? Cold in California. Which, by the way, can you imagine being Mexico? And this has just been taken away from you? You're like, what's up there? Oh, now I really hate you guys. Um, so it turns out people like gold. And lots of people move to California. 
And California overnight, this is a long, complex story, obviously, that I'm just, I'm just sliding over. But um, California overnight has enough people to become a state. And it petitions to become a state. All right, and this, and it become, petitions to become a state as a free state. And this is not the inauguration of these controversies, right? This is the intensification of these controversies about what that's going to mean long term. And so California inaugurates a crisis, all right? And so I always pause here, all right? Because I want to explain to my students how did white Southerners and white Northerners see the problem or controversy over California as we're on the eve of 1850? To illustrate for them that they're walking in with ideas already formed, all right? These aren't just emerging in the 1850s. The 1850s becomes a period when they become intensified and paranoia on both sides watching each other goes through the roof. And you have to understand that to understand how war breaks out in 1860, 61. But they're building off of debates and discussions and controversies up until this point. All right? And so I would emphasize for you guys, when you're talking about the TEKS, when you're talking about these readiness standards and what you have to meet, when you talk about the causes and effects of the US-Mexico War, it's integral. All right, to talk about the causes being this expansion across the continent, um, cotton, slavery, taxes, all those sorts of pieces, right? And then the consequences are a further intensification of those debates, all right? You need to connect both of those things because they are connected, and that helps it make sense for our students. When we have these arcs where things don't just appear out of nowhere, but have this longer context where they can see that evolution and, and they can feel that tension rising for themselves about how would have they felt if they were a white southerner, white northerner, or an enslaved person experiencing all this stuff, right? So when we talk about this, I try to frame this both northern and southern perspectives, because northerners and southerners saw this in very different ways, right? So I always have my stand-in for a white southerner or white northerner, right? So here's a white southerner um, looking westward, right? Maybe he lives in Texas, maybe he lives in, lives in Virginia, but he believes very strongly that slavery must be allowed to expand west, that California ideally would be a slave state. Why does he feel so strongly about that? He doesn't live there. He's probably not gonna go to Arizona and try to set up a cotton plantation, right? So why does he feel so strongly that way? Yes, but why does that matter? Well, the balance of power in what? The US Senate, right? So why would that matter to him? Because slavery won't go away then where he does exist, right? This, the, the West becomes a lot of things, but one of the things it is, and I, I emphasize this to my students, I would, I would recommend you, you, you bring it up for yours, is that the West is not just theoretical, all right? It's a proxy war sort of situation, right? Because if California becomes free states and the balance of power goes toward the North, what happens to the Southern states, right? And what happens to future states as well? Both Northerners and Southerners are thinking in these terms, not just because they, they want to keep their territory slave or free, but because it'll have real world consequences for them. All right? So if you're this white southerner and you live in Texas or Virginia or somewhere in between those two edges of the south, um, what are you trying to defend? A way of life that, defend, that supports you, an economic system that's very, very powerful, right? Your investment in a political system that keeps you at a top level and other people not, these are all positives for you and your family that you want to maintain. And I want to emphasize, once again, cotton is enormously important to consider here because it is after the U.S.-Mexico War that cotton prices once again boom like they've never boomed before, right? During the 1850s, cotton is going bananas, right? That's a technical term. And it's more profitable than it's ever been. Slavery, I know you know this, but it's worth emphasizing. Slavery's not dying at the eve of the Civil War, as some of my students would like to assume that it's going to be on its way out because it does go away. Um, it's, it's more profitable than it's ever been. Right? In part because cotton markets are just going absolutely through the roof. So the investment of, um, of planters in all of this is enormous. By the eve of the Civil War, let me give you a number here. The eve of the Civil War, white Southerners have $3 billion invested in enslaved people. $3 billion, and that is in 1860, Mike. All right? Enormous investment. All right? My students can usually understand that economic argument. Then after that, I have to explain, like, and guess what? They really believed it was a good system. My students have a very hard time with that, right? Because they, they, they want to believe these white Southerners had this, like, inner turmoil about this somehow deep down. And I say, white Southerners did not get up every day going, you know what? I'm gonna, I feel like oppressing people today. I'm going to be a terrible person to everybody I meet, right? They woke up every day believing they were doing good for themselves and their families. We don't have to agree with them, 
right? Enslaving people is an obvious and overt wrong, but you have to understand why they thought the way they thought if you're gonna understand why they did what they did. And so one of the documents we're gonna be talking about in the workshop later this afternoon is going to be them, white Southerners, in this case from Texas, explaining their perspective on slavery and why they think it's a good thing, right? They're wrong, it's a terrible thing. But they believed that, and you have to understand that to understand why this guy believes slavery must expand west, and it's not just good for him. It's good for everybody, would be his argument, right? So with his economy, his social system, everything about all of that tied up at once, right? My students usually can wrap their minds around that. Why do white northerners feel so strongly in the opposite direction, right? Why do they so much oppose slavery? As was pointed out earlier, white northerners profit usually in more opaque kind of ways from, uh, from enslavement and may not feel a direct tie to that, may not even be aware of it. But the North definitely is invested in this whole system. Um, but most white Northerners nonetheless would tell you slavery's wrong. Why would they think slavery is wrong? Well, okay, yeah, so, so there are some religious, and especially if you're talking about abolitionists in particular, because abolitionism, especially in the English model from the Anglicans and the, um, uh, and the Quakers, you know, really has a long sort of tradition. Morally, it is wrong, right? And we want to we want to emphasize that, right? As was mentioned earlier, I think it's where a lot of the abolitionists um, approach the idea of, of slavery as a moral, not just in wrong, but horrific injustice that must be ended now. So we talk about William Lloyd Garrison here, right? And the 1830s going forward, this sort of immediacism of the Garrisonian era of abolitionism, right? It's like it has to end now because darn it, it's wrong. It's bad. And was pointed out earlier, very rightly so. That's not what most white northerners think. Most white northerners think this guy's crazy. Most white northerners think, and my white students always think that this is like the North, William Lloyd Garrison. No, this guy was drugged through the streets of Boston and threatened to be lynched because most white northerners thought he was insane and did not like him, all right? Abolitionists are remarkable for a lot of things, one of which is they persist not only in opposition to the white South and the slave system, but really opposition within the North and, and the, 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 the great challenges of which they persisted under all of that is remarkable. So it's not because most white northerners think there's a, the same level of moral problem that, that William Lloyd Garrison would argue for, or Frederick Douglass or something like that. Um, so white northerners, right, when they're thinking about this, they're saying slavery is wrong. And they would say it's, a lot of them would say it's, it's, it's morally wrong in some sort of capacity. Abraham Lincoln famously said, right, that if, if slavery is not wrong, nothing's wrong, right? Um, but that didn't necessarily mean that they thought this was wrong largely because it was impinging on the rights of African Americans, right? Or that they were primarily concerned with the rights of African Americans. Um, white Northerners would say it's wrong because it's economically inefficient, which is actually not quite accurate. Unfortunately, slavery turned out to be very profitable and very efficient in, 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 in most of its instances, which is actually terrifying. Um, but they would call it economically inefficient. It's bad politically. It's bad for the American political system. And then on top of all of that, it threatens white people, all right? And if you want a baseline sort of reason that many white Northerners could get behind and coalesce around of opposition to slavery, they have a lot of different reasons, but one kind of common line is that it wasn't good for white people, right? So if you're a poor white Northerner, and I want to emphasize too, most white Northerners don't live in cities, aren't industrialized, have nothing to do with that. 98% or something like that of white Northerners are farmers, just like white Southerners, all right? But they do, they, their system is a very different sort of system. If you're a poor white northerner, your way up in the world is not to save up and buy slaves like you would hope in the white south. Um, it is to work for somebody for a wage, save up enough money, and buy yourself a farm. Which means you have economic independence and, and economic freedom and liberty, and you're beholden to nobody, right? That, that is freedom, right? But to do that, what do you have to have? Enough money and a high enough wage that you can actually save enough money to be able to do all that. If you allow slavery into a territory, say white northerners, what is that gonna do to white wages? Yes, it's gonna depress white wages, right? So a large percentage of white northerners are opposing slavery. And this blows my students' minds. I can imagine what like 12 year olds and 13 year olds think about this, right? But I try to impress upon them, not out of interest of the enslaved, but out of self-interest, right? And a lot of them don't white want African Americans living among them out of just pure racism, right? White Northerners are basically as, white, as, as, as openly, virulently racist as white Southerners during this era. If you doubt that, show your students the 1851 Constitution of Indiana, which said no black people are allowed in Indiana, right? This is, this is an effort to, to keep out for, for white farmers 
and, and keep that going forward. So when you talk about TEAK standards, right, that you have to, the readiness standards, right, of analyzing the impacts of slavery on the different sections of the United States, you need to talk about all of these things, right? But what I would argue is that one of the most important things to focus on is that Northerners and Southerners are both farmers, right? But they have a different experience with labor and its effect on the economy and political and social systems. It comes down to slavery, right? That matters in understanding the differences in how they see these issues going forward, right? They share so much. They have the same language, they read the same books, they have most of the same culture, all those sorts of things. But they have a different perspective on these issues because of the slavery issue, right? It's not that white Northerners are all living in cities and being industrialized and just have a very different world. They don't in certain senses. They're growing wheat instead of cotton, but they have so much in common. It's the slavery issue that divides them, right? And that's what changes so many different things. And that's something that's highly worth emphasizing in all of this, right? So these two guys have fundamentally opposing views on if slavery should expand west or not, right? And that's what comes to the fore when you start hitting the 1850s. So by the time we get to the 1850s, all of this is true. All of this has happened. It's not out of whole cloth. And you have to have that background or the 1850s is just this crazy ride of insanity, which it kind of is anyway, right? But like when you talk about the compromises that are being debated within the US Senate, right? And this is famous, you know, here's Henry Clay looking all like regal and such. Um, I love Calhoun over here like sticking his head out like, what are you saying? That's crazy. Um, but these become the debates of the 1850s that are people are entrenched. And then in the 1850s is a period of further entrenchment and the disillusion of the ability to compromise. All right? That is the, the story of increasing tensions. That is the only way it makes sense by 1860, 61, they're ready to shoot each other. All right? And so you know, here they are trying to mash out compromises. You guys know, I won't go through the details of the compromise of 1850, because California comes in as a free state. That makes the Norths happy. So you got to give the South something, um, Fugitive Slave Act, where they're trying to they say northern states have to um, be a, complicit in and a part of capturing runaway slaves from the South. Territories can be whatever they want, popular sovereignty, essentially Utah, New Mexico. And then slavery itself uh, is legal in Washington, D.C., but the trade itself is abolished in the nation's capital. It's a compromise. Does it solve anything? Not really. Right? Everybody walks away from that, Northern and Southern, thinking, I got screwed. Um, and this is, again, the 1850s is this period of decreasing ability to compromise and the middle ground slowly going away. And it's, it's produced by a whole lot of things, right? So 1850 compromise, go forward four years, right? The Kansas-Nebraska Act, where what used to be the, the areas because of the Missouri Compromise, settled territory for free states becomes, nope, now it's... It's, it's Nebraska and Kansas, and thank you, Stephen Douglas. Um, the first people who get there will get to decide if it's going to be slave states or free states, right? So what's the result of that? I mean, Kansas, right? And that's something else I'd emphasize for you guys. Think of leading Kansas, frame leading Kansas for your students as a civil war. It is. There are two different factions who have set up rival governments, and they're killing each other. You got Topeka and Lecompton and these, these battles back and forth. But 1860 doesn't happen out of nowhere, right? This is this process by which these things happen. So you have Southerners and Northerners rushing into Kansas. Kansas never had more than 200 enslaved people in it during this entire time period. So it's all theoretical and this proxy war of the West to help control territory that helps decide what's happening in the Senate and in this larger sense, North and South as they already exist, right? We have people killing each other. You've got John Brown showing up. And you know, Brown is a great example of um, the extremes at which this goes to, right? So Brown's very different than William Lloyd Garrison. William Lloyd Garrison did not believe in using violence, right? He was of a nonviolent tradition. Um, John Brown says, you know, uh, the ends justify the means. And so he uses violence, and I would argue terrorism, as a way of advancing his political goals, right? We don't have to lionize that, and I don't with my students. Um, but John Brown had enormous impact. As well, right? So he and his, he, you know, the massacres that happened with him and his sons and some other people in Kansas really bring his name to the national fore. But it, the reason I'd emphasize this to you guys is this rising tension, right? The 1850s is that amplification of what came before. The other big thing that comes out of the compromise of the Nebraska, um, Kansas Nebraska Act, is the founding of the Republican Party in 1854, right? And again, I would emphasize to your students the role that slavery is playing in all these different issues. That's a line of continuity. All right, from the revolutionary period up to the Civil War that you can hang a lot of things on. Because what creates the 
the, the, the Republican Party, it's, it's this effort to prevent slavery from expanding west. How white northerners didn't want slavery to expand west for a lot of reasons, primarily self-interest, is the epicenter of the Republican Party. They are founded specifically to prevent the spread of slavery west. That's literally their only plank on their platform, right? I mean, they have other things, but that's the only thing they really stand for, right? And they're explicitly a sectional party, which is to say no white southerner is going to vote for them, right? Which means, and this is something else to emphasize, and I, 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 I hit this hard with my students, the ability to compromise, which is a fundamental part of the American political system, is eroding. It is going away. The middle ground disappears. Because what is the one thing that Republicans cannot compromise on? The expansion of slavery going west. It's the one thing that they stand for, right? And so that middle ground kind of capacity is, is going away. And then when uh, the 1856 presidential election happens, only two years after the founding of the Republican Party, right? Um, there's a remarkable electoral map that, that emerges on this. And, it, and I like to take this apart with my students. Like we look at this and say, what does it mean? What does it look like? And it looks like very sectional, right? Um, the, the Republicans who are in red right there, right? They only win northern states and really the far extreme northern space, states and all this, right? John C. Fremont, who's the, the nominee for the 1856 Republican Party, he's not, he doesn't win the White House. But what's amazing about this is how well the Republican Party actually does that they win that many states, only two years after the founding. And then everybody can do the math very quickly, right? There's more population in the North, therefore more electoral votes. Therefore, the white North can elect a president. It is actually possible without any Southern votes, all right? So Republicans say, yay. White Southerners say, that's terrible. But they also say that's probably never gonna happen because the Democratic Party is not a sectional party, right? It is a national party. And therefore, as long as the Democrats can keep it together long enough, to win states, some states in the North, they'll be fine, right? This is, you know, when you see uh, Buchanan, who was from Pennsylvania, he won Pennsylvania, right? But you have Illinois, Indiana, right? You've got, you've got several Northern states right here that if you just keep a hold of those, you'll be fine, right? So uh, the, the alarmingness of all this stuff goes on. The Dred Scott decision the very next year, I wanna emphasize the boom, boom, boom experience, right? Of all of this. And reading this in the newspapers of the era, even if you're far away in Texas, Florida, or you're in Maine, you're, you're reading about all of this and it feels very real in your living room. Much as you guys look at the news today or look at your phones, like you're not there where that happens, but the news comes to you quickly and you realize the impact on your larger section and it's scary. Because again, it feels like these things are spinning out of control. The Dred Scott decision, you know, where the Supreme Court of the United States essentially tries to end the slavery controversy by saying black people have no rights recognized under the US Constitution. That's why just, uh, Dred Scott's case for freedom is, is the, dismissed. And then the case then goes on to say, of course, that, uh, that the US government has no power to outlaw the expansion of slavery into the territories whatsoever, which is ironic because it had been doing that since the founding of the Republic. Suddenly the Supreme Court says you can't do that. That didn't slow anything down. It just amplified the situation so that at the eve of all of this, you know, we get to the late 1850s, tensions have risen to almost a crescendo. Right? And there's a paranoia that's hard to explain sometimes to our students about living through all of that. That helps explain the extreme ways Northerners and Southerners are now seeing each other. Right? And the person who lights the powder keg, of course, is once again John Brown with his raid, October 16th, 1859, when he decides to, ride, to incite a slave uprising in Harper's Ferry, Virginia. And his hope was to end slavery violently by empowering the enslaved to murder every white person they could. They could and then have this you know, sea of contagion of liberty go across the South. You have four million people who could be their own liberators, he hopes, right? They raid Parper's Ferry, take it over. Um, it doesn't work because nobody told the enslaved of Virginia that there was gonna be a slave uprising, so no one showed up for the weapons at Harper's Ferry when that happened. The people who did show up were the US Marine Corps um, under Robert E. Lee, and they take back over. Um, they capture John Brown, he is quickly hung. Again, this resolves nothing. Tensions rise higher, right? And this is the eve of a presidential election. And, and that's what really matters in this whole larger story about how we get to that moment. The, 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 the election that's about to come, right, kind of crystallizes all those tensions that have been rising and these opposing views of people over time, right? And, and I know you know the story of all of this, um, but I want to finish the arc here real fast. Um, so in the aftermath of John Brown's raid, white Southerners, especially in the Deep South, say, we're not gonna have anybody be the candidate for the Democratic Party who isn't vociferously pro-slavery expanding West, right? We need someone who will, oppose, who will enforce the Dred Scott decision, essentially. And so they demand a pro-Southern candidate. 
the Democratic Party comes together in South Carolina, hems and haws, and who do they nominate? Stephen A. Douglas, right? who is not a Southerner and not vehemently pro-slavery expanding West. This is the architect of popular sovereignty, right? So he's like, well, whoever gets there first, that's a good compromise sort of way. Very prominent politician in the Democratic Party, but he's not who the Deep South won. So the Deep South leaves the convention, Texas included, by the way. They go down the street and they nominate somebody else, John, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Breckenridge, John C. Breckenridge, who's a Kentuckian who says slavery must expand West, right? So what has the Democratic Party done? Slip themselves, right? And again, it's over slavery and this paranoia now that is developed by this point about what the North might do, what the Republicans might do. And so in doing this, the, the Democratic Party and the Southerners in particular actually weaken their position and do the most irrational thing they probably could have done, which is create a situation where the Republicans can benefit from this, right? If somehow they can nominate somebody who can appeal to the entire white North. And to do that, who do you need to nominate? Somebody who's not controversial, right? Somebody who's fairly boring. Somebody who you vaguely have heard of but nobody really knows very much about. And he's fairly inoffensive because he's just so blah. He is just vanilla as you possibly can get for his era, right? So they nominate Lincoln, not because he's an extremist on either side of the Republican Party, but because he's about in the middle of the road and he's somebody who you can possibly, he's best known for losing a Senate race to Stephen A. Douglas. Um, and so this is who the Republicans nominate, right? Somebody who feels vaguely cozy to most white Northerners in a vague sort of way, non-threatening. Does he look non-threatening to the white South? No, he looks terrifying <laughs> to the white South, right? This is a little known Brady portrait of uh, Lincoln he took during vacation one time. Um, he liked to let his hair down and then up. Um, now I put that up there as an example because this is how the white South saw Lincoln by this point. They have distorted him, all right, to an extreme level. We know this because they said it. They said it over and over again. One of the documents we're gonna use is this document in the workshop later today. We're gonna talk about how they were viewing Lincoln. We're gonna break this thing down right here to talk about how I use this in my classroom, how you can use it in your classroom to explain how they're misrepresenting Lincoln, but they believe it. And that's part of the way you have to understand what leads to secession is this sort of um, paranoia by looking through a particular prism about you know, the South and the United States and what Lincoln was. Because when it looks like this man's actually going to win the election in November of 1860, panic has ensued across the South. And it's the product not of the last 10 years. It's a product of decades and decades and decades of, of battles and arguments going back and forth. So when you're hitting these standards with the teaks and the causes of the Civil War, and this was talked about at the very beginning right here, when you have the multiple um, causes that have been the teaks, and this is being revised and has been revised, right? But for a long time it said sectionalism, states' rights, and slavery are the causes of the Civil War. None of those make sense without slavery being the center of that. What is the sectionalism? It's about slavery. What are the states' rights? It's the states' rights about slavery. They're not fighting over the tariff anymore. The South won that fight, right? That's not the controversy. The question is, what is this going to mean for the expansion and future of the country? And by this point, the South feels, the white South feels, that secession and defending their own rights, as they would describe it, under, the, under their political rights and this new country they're going to form the Confederacy is the way, uh, ultimately, to preserve this system that they've been investing in for a very long time. Right? And that matters enormously for understanding what happens next and really how we think about liberty and freedom and citizenship today. We can draw a very straight line because these are the controversies that lead not only to the 13th Amendment and slavery, but the 14th Amendment that for the first time defines what it means to be a citizen of the United States. Thank you guys, I appreciate listening to me.